Well, good evening and welcome. Um, my name is Mark Rush. I'm professor of politics and law and also director of the Center for International Education. And it's my privilege and honor um, to, to welcome all of you to this evening's event. Uh, this is one of those events on campus, and there are many of them that make us stop and appreciate just w what a great place Washington and Lee is. Um, it's wonderful to be able to in invite a speaker of the caliber and stature of tonight's guest, uh, have them meet our students, and then become jealous of our being faculty here and wondering how they might join us because our <laughs> students our students are the greatest, and we're so fortunate to be a part of the community um, in which we get to work with them for four years, and then after they graduate. Uh, so it is. It's wonderful to be here this evening. Thank you all for coming. Um, tonight's talk is entitled uh, Unprecedented. Um, our guest speaker, Jonathan Rausch, um, is a fellow at the Brookings Institution. He is a nationally syndicated columnist. He is a contributing editor to the Atlantic Monthly. He has written numerous books, articles, and white papers on American politics. And in fact, um, it was the article he wrote, oh, a year and a couple of months ago, last summer, 2016, uh, that really inspired us to invite him tonight. That article was entitled, How American Politics Went Insane. Um, who would have known? Um, but this article really was a fascinating piece and a, and a wonderful uh, investigation of just changes that have occurred to American politics over the last 40 or 50 years, and really describes, in Jonathan's estimation, just how we've become, what he describes, um, chaotic. And he describes the current era as an era of chaos. Um, Tonight's, tonight's uh, event is sponsored by the Williams School and its series on conversations in the age of Trump. And that will be the format. Jonathan and I will have a conversation. I will throw him all sorts of easy questions that he will hit out of the park like softballs. And then we will open it up to discussion from the audience and uh, question Q&A for mainly Jonathan, I hope. You all can ask me questions anytime. It is also co-sponsored by the Center for International Education's Colloquium on Borders and Their Human Impact. And that is made possible by the generosity of the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. So without further ado, let me invite and welcome our guest to the stage, this evening's speaker, Jonathan Rausch. And oh, sorry. You're comfortable. Whoa. And don't mind. Yeah, these things are mobile. We, we, we heard about this. Um, this could be fun. If we, if we get excited, around. this could be. Um, and we're, we're wired. We're wearing like six mics between us. So um, let me well, begin by saying thanks. Welcome. Uh, let me begin by saying what a privilege it is to be here. And thank you all for coming here on a beautiful evening. We um, spent the afternoon. I, I got a walking tour of the campus. I don't remember when I saw a more beautiful campus on a more perfect day. So thank you so much for, for the opportunity to be here. Well, well to begin, um, we're running a conversation here, and uh, the audience is going to be taking notes. So let me begin by just starting with the title that you chose for your presentation, well, our conversation, Unprecedented, Governing in an Era of Chaos. What makes the current era of politics so chaotic, and, and how does it compare to prior areas? How do we get into this mess? Well, let's talk about what the mess is. Um, there's something the Constitution doesn't provide for. It's how politicians organize themselves to get stuff done. The Constitution sets up multiple branches of government and multiple duties. But suppose I need your vote on the debt limit bill so the government doesn't default on the national debt. And suppose your voting on that is going to expose you to a primary challenge back home. And suppose you multiply this by 435 because I'm the Speaker of the House. How do we deal with that? Nothing in the Constitution about it. How do you bring order from the chaos that is 435 independently elected Capitol Hill politicians, plus, of course, president and vice president, not to mention everyone else in America, all independent operators? Traditionally, the answer to that has been political parties and political machines, which developed right after the founding. And basically, they're favor economies. They're ways that politicians do favors for each other, and then politicians do favors for their constituents and their interest groups and their funders who do favors back. And in that way, they organize their world so that every day they kind of know who's on their side. And if you 
play on the right team, if you're a good team player, if you're a loyalist, if you come through the ranks, as opposed to being a sociopath, you'll get rewarded. <laughs> you'll get, you know, maybe that runway, the second runway for the airport in your district, or maybe uh, you'll get some campaign money from me, or maybe I'll take this, my, my friend, the donor over here, the fat cat, maybe I'll ask him to drop $50,000 in your campaign, or maybe I'll use my connections in your district to make it harder to challenge you in a primary. All kinds of ways politicians looked after each other. Starting in the 1970s, actually a bit earlier, but starting in the 1970s, um, we, country, out of the best of intentions, looked at the individual things that politicians did to organize their world, and we said, well, that looks corrupt. Pork barrel spending, earmarks, soft money, that was unregulated money that the parties were, were using and raising and spreading around. We said, the people should pick the nominees, not the parties. So we went to a primary system, which means that anyone could be challenged at any time. We opened the smoke-filled rooms. We got rid of um, law. We, we, we imposed transparency requirements. They're not uniform, but they make it much harder to have a closed-door, candid conversation. Uh, we disempowered the old seniority system in Congress, where people who'd been there a long time and served loyally um, were empowered. I could go down the list, but the end result of all this is that after a while you get in a situation where if I'm Paul Ryan and, your vote, and I need your vote, all I can really do is plead for it. And you're not worried about me, you're worried about a primary challenge back home. Well, multiply that by 435 times, and what used to be routine business in the Capitol, stuff like appropriations bills and farm bills and surface transportation bills, to say nothing of the really heavy lifts like tax reform or welfare reform, all become like herding cats. Uh, my article, I call this chaos syndrome. Uh, and I argue that the Trump phenomenon and the Sanders phenomenon and the Cruz phenomenon, where you have an outsider coming in and basically attacking a party from the outside, having a shot at the nomination, is a symptom of this problem. Um, it's very hard for anyone to govern in this situation. It's especially hard if you're someone who, like Donald Trump, comes in from outside of politics. Um, has no connections in the party. People don't owe him a debt. He had negative coattails. And then there's the matter of his temperament, which is particular to him. But I try to emphasize to people, when Donald Trump passes from the scene, the underlying problem that, that made it so difficult for parties and political processes to get organized will continue. So let me ask along those lines then, if the election had gone the other way and Hillary Clinton had won, would she too be a, a symptom of the same political chaos that you're describing? You mean she in particular, or? Well, in so, so far as, as Trump navigated all of this, as you said, and the chaos seemed to lend, it, yeah. lend itself so, to him, whereas Hillary Clinton was working a different, more traditional yes. path towards the White House. It's, it was interesting to contrast the two, and to contrast especially Hillary Clinton with Bernie Sanders. Hillary Clinton is a model Democrat. She has been a creature of the party for 30 years. She has paid her debts. Uh, back when I last looked at it, April of, uh, of 2016, she had raised $20 million for the Democratic Party to spend on other candidates. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Why is she doing that? Well, then they'll be indebted to her, and when she's into office, she'll be able to pick up the phone and say, you know, say, Mark, uh, I need your help. So Bernie Sanders, at the same time in that campaign cycle, can you guess how much he had raised for other Democrats? Probably not, probably not as much. Can you, you want to take a stab at the number? Oh, zero? Actually, it wasn't zero. It was $1,000 <laughs> because that was the minimum you needed to open the bank account. <laughs> so Bernie wasn't doing any of that. He's a complete outsider. He wants to be the nominee. Then the Democratic National Committee comes and says, all right, well, we've got these two people. Bernie becomes a Democrat on the last day that it's possible to register as a Democrat before filing for the New Hampshire primary. He is not a Democrat. He even says, I'm not a Democrat, but I'm running as one because that's easier for me. Uh, then the Democratic National Committee says, OK, so on the one hand, we have a loyal creature of the party, someone who has worked with us, raised money for us, been a loyalist, done many jobs in a respectable, reliable way for many years running. 
And we have an insurgent outsider who is uh, deliberately says he's not a Democrat, doesn't do anything to help other Democrats, and comes in from the outside. We're supposed to treat them equally. In any other democracy in the world, people would look at you and say, of course not. The party's job is to help party people. That's how you organize in politics. You reward the loyalists, and then you try to marginalize the people who are trying to hurt you. Well, let me ask, though, what you're describing sounds very similar to 1968, 1972, when the insiders were keeping the outsiders from making their way into the nominating convention. And so it seems that what you're, what you're describing was a bad thing. We had members of Congress who had been there for years who were essentially blocking the passage of civil rights laws because they controlled committees and they were the beneficiaries of seniority. And then in the conventions of 1968, there was so much violence and uproar um, because despite the fact that we had actually run some primaries, the party insiders, Nixon and Humphrey, got the nod despite the fact that there was tremendous popular unrest and really opposition to them. So why is what we're experiencing today not a good thing? It's essentially the product of that era. So is this a better era or was that better back then when we had party bosses and such strong members of Congress? What, what you want is a balance. Um, I argue we had a kind of sweet spot between about 1964 and about 1994. Um, in 1964, we finally overthrew the reign of the Southern segregationists mm -hmm. who were bottling up things in Congress. Um, that was not so much a result of the insider political process as it was the tactics that those particular people were using and that they were able to use in the Democratic Party. Uh, Judge Smith and the Rules Committee gets thrown out and we begin to pass civil rights bills. It is worth pointing out, if I may, that the 1964 Civil Rights Bill, Lyndon Johnson's landmark, was passed because he didn't have enough Democratic votes, too many segregationists, so he calls up Charlie Halleck, who is the Republican leader, minority leader in the House, says, Charlie, what do you need to, to, for you and a couple other Republicans to vote for this bill? And Charlie Halleck says, well, Mr. President, how about a research center for my district? As good as done, pork is what got the Civil Rights Bill through. So it's a very useful thing. For about 30 years, we're in something like, I would argue, a sweet spot where routine business gets done pretty efficiently. The committee system works very much as it should. 1994, at the other end of this process, an insurgent named Newt Gingrich comes along. Gingrich centralizes power, which is not the same as running an effective political machine. A, pol a, mach a machine is, when it works, it's decentralized. It distributes power throughout the party so people owe each other a lot of favors. And then we begin to get into the world that, that we're in now. To your question, no, of course, no system is perfect. Every system will be subject to abuse. Every system needs to be watched. Um, I am not saying that we, if, even if we could magically go into a time machine and return to Tammany Hall, that we should do that. Um, Tammany Hall had many virtues. There's a lot of revisionist history about all the good it did for working people, lower class Irish people who were rejected by other parts of the political system. But all of these things are flawed. But here's the difference. Those systems were capable of organizing politics. And it turns out when we take apart the machines and the parties and the favor networks and the political economies, there's nothing else to replace them. So it's not like those were perfect. It's like this just doesn't function. Routine legislation now is a crisis on Capitol Hill. You know, appropriations bills, it's been 20 years. Appropriations bills are the routine spending bills. We're supposed to pass 13 every year. Uh, when it works, you never even hear about it. It's been 20 years since Congress has been able to go through those, that process in the way it should. Well, let's talk a bit then about Tammany Hall, because it's a great metaphor for both, I guess, the best and the worst of American politics, mm. depending on when you would observe it. Um, I'm sure there was a lot of constituency service, but um, one of your muses uh, is, is highlighted in a great <laughs> book on, uh, on American politics, Plunkett of Tammany Hall. Now, what he does, what we're talking about as pork, he described as honest graft. Honest graft. I, that's gonna be kind of hard to sell to the American people right now, isn't it? Hey, get some honest graft. So raise your hand if you think that the correct amount of corruption in a political system is greater than zero. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> so, okay. now this is interesting. Um, in the world of Washington reformers, people are shocked by this idea, but when I ask people on the street this question, 
they kind of get it. Okay, so raise your hand if you've heard of George Washington Plunkett. A few people have. We're showing our age. Wow. Well, also some people who are apparently well-educated undergraduates. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, um, my favorite political book of all time is probably Plunkett of Tammany Hall. George Washington Plunkett was a functionary of the Tammany Hall political machine in New York. And in the 1890s and early 1900s, he mm. used to hold forth at the shoe sign stand on the steps of the Manhattan County Courthouse, which was kind of Tammany headquarters, and deliver impromptu lectures about politics. And a reporter named Reardon took these down, published them in a very short, hilarious book called Plunkett of Tammany Hall, which is, is it fair to say, taken seriously by political scientists? Oh, it's absolutely. Yeah. yeah, so it is hilarious because it's all done in dialect. Plunkett is very funny. But what he says is very serious. He has the concept of honest graft. He draws a distinction. There's corruption that you do to enrich yourself personally. You line your pockets, you're in it for yourself. That's bad. But then he says there's a kind of corruption that you need, graft to keep the wheels of the system turning so that you can incentivize people to do stuff and keep the party running. And that's the kind of graft that happens when you take a little money from, I don't know, it might be a kickback over here and you use it to bribe an official over here and you manage to get the bill passed and that's how you run a political machine. Now, of course, that's illegal and we're not, today, we wouldn't defend it as a good thing. But Plunkett is saying there is such a thing as honest graft and you need stuff like pork barrel spending to make a system work. He's also a big defender of parties. And he says, if you don't have parties that are able to make these decisions and that are strong and capable of negotiating, you'll get, well, his way of, of putting it is all hell will break loose. Now, today we'd call that political chaos. Um, Plunkett is, is taken seriously. Um, and it turns out that his prediction turns out to be accurate. If you go too far in dismantling all this stuff, all hell breaks loose. So if you want to stop hell from breaking loose, however, it seems um, that if you essentially strengthen political parties, or at least go back to the modus operandi of the machines, the one thing that won't happen is quick change. Yeah, yeah. Is that a good thing? Because it seems that was well, the quick, great... Quick, quick change is usually a bad thing. Fair enough. But that was the logjam in the 60s. We couldn't yeah. get the Civil Rights Act through. We could not open up the nomination process. 18-year-olds were protesting. They were being sent off to Vietnam and didn't have the right to vote, and the parties weren't really addressing this. So sometimes you need a bit of quick change, but it seems that all of the reforms we saw were designed to at least remove the, the blockades to any sort of change whatsoever. So how do we strike a middle point between unnecessarily quick change, which leads us to chaos, but a, say, a seniority system in Congress that seems throughout history at least, to lend itself to moving incredibly incrementally at the expense, perhaps, of needed change? It's a big question. If I could just push back on the premise for just a moment, mm -hmm. however, I would argue that the candidates that the smoke-filled rooms picked, uh, including Hubert Humphrey, were exceptional people. Mm -hmm. And I would argue that throughout uh, the New Deal and the post-war era, the decisions that were made by that political decision system were, on the main, civil rights took time, They're ultimately the system also made the right decisions. But in other spheres, um, the system made outstanding decisions. Mm -hmm. I would also point out that popular approval of government was much higher, right. trust in government was much higher. That system did a pretty darn good job. And it turns out there's modern political science that compares the candidates who were selected by party officials in smoke-filled rooms and the candidates selected today who are self-selected because they say, I'm going to run and enter a primary, and on objective criteria that, you know, you look at things that you can objectively measure, the smoke-filled room candidates were at least as good and often better. So I would argue that system in the main did a good job and that the people thought it did a good job. It did have its flaws. So to your question of can you go, would it be fair to sort of restate that is can you, can you move back toward a sweet spot? Sure, and how, Too much? how might we move there? Yeah. So. Um, reconstituting anything like the old way of doing things is not possible and it's not the point. Can we, however, reconstitute some of the tools that politicians need to organize the world? The answer is clearly yes, and there are people trying to do it right now. One of those people, for example, happens to be the Senate Majority Leader, Mitch McConnell, a classic machine politician. 
uh, of the old school, who has, for example, tried to do something a lot of political scientists increasingly think is a good idea, which is, this, will be, this gets technical, guys, but bear with me. I'll try to get to the big ideas behind it. He wants to lift the caps on the amount of money that political parties can raise. So right now, political parties have very strict limits on how much they can raise to help their own candidates, which ties their hands compared to these outside groups like, I don't know, the, the Koch brothers and Americans for Prosperity, and there are tons of them on the left. The parties are at a disadvantage because of all these restrictions we put on them when we thought they were corrupt. So people say, unshackle them. It's not a solution to everything, but at least they'll be more competitive if they can raise unlimited sums. Now, does that mean that Sheldon Adelson um, can drop a $10 million donation on a campaign and funnel it through the Republican or Democratic Party? Yeah, it does mean that. That's what soft money was. But again, political scientists, many of them who think about this say, the money's going somewhere. Right now, it's going around the machines and parties to kind of these private actors, these insurgent groups on the outside that increasingly and unaccountably control the process. If you let the money go back into the system, the parties are the best place to put it because they're like gigantic clearinghouses. You can maybe buy a candidate with a $10 million contribution, but you can't buy a whole party because the party's entire job is to balance competing interests. So one thing people talk about is lifting these caps and also lifting restrictions on whether parties can actually work with their own candidates in their campaigns, which they're very limited in being able to do, a silly rule. Mitch McConnell wants to do that. A lot of people want to do that. Uh, right now, at present, there are tons of people on Capitol Hill who want to lift the ban on so-called earmarks. You all know what earmarks are. Those are special provisions in law that bestow little nuggets of money on particular members of Congress. Well, those got out of hand, then they got reformed, but then they got abolished, and it turns out, um, as former uh, Senate Majority Leader Trent Lott said, it's very hard to get people to do anything if you don't have any carrots and you don't have any sticks. Right now, I would say a majority of members on Capitol Hill want to remove that restriction so that they can go back to giving out these, these carrots. That's hard to do because it looks bad, the, the optics are terrible, uh, but people talk about that. Another form of reform, which is very important and very controversial, but which the Democratic Party is dealing with right now, is should the party, should party officials and elders, the party professionals, the people with the long-term stake in the party's brand and in decision-making in government, should they have more say in who the nominees of their party are? You've all heard of superdelegates. Super, superdelegates, yes. So you all know what those are? Um, Anyone need a quick description? Superdelegates or Democratic Party officials, mostly elected officials, who automatically get a vote at the convention. This was done in the 1980s to prevent a disaster where an insurgent comes in from outside who's unelectable um, and loses everything. Contrary to myth, superdelegates are not in a position to overturn the will of the public in a primary. It's inconceivable to most people that that could happen. What they can do is create a speed bump at the beginning of the process. So if you want the presidential nomination, you're aware that there are these 600 people who are going to be voting at the end of the day, and you're going to want their votes, so you're going to go talk to them. You're going to begin thinking about them early in the process. You're going to be thinking about the needs of the party and being accountable to the party. Sanders people are outraged at the existence of superdelegates. They want the people to decide because they think that will help them. Uh, Hillary Clinton types, traditionalists want to keep the superdelegates because they want to prevent a Trump-style disaster. That debate is going on in the Democratic Party right now. People like me think it is important that the parties have an institutional role in selecting the nominees. Now, it sounds to me is an accurate comparison. It strikes me as possible. Superdelegates would be more or less akin in some ways to the Electoral College. They would be this upper or professional tier of the political system which could buffer the power of the people or in some time, at least with, the, with regard to the Electoral College, go against it. That raises hackles every now and then when you get a perverse electoral outcome. So would it be, how would we sell superdelegates, I guess, to the voters if the whole purpose well, yeah. of having a primary is to let the voters decide? 
The sales job is a big problem well, here, okay. right? <laughs> so um, the comparison with the Electoral College is flawed. The Electoral College is a rubber stamp. No one goes and talks to the Electoral College when they think about running for president. Uh, Superdelegates are people that it's helpful to go mm -hmm. talk to okay. because they're elected officials. Um, so different kind of thing. But, but the larger question is, so now here, Mark, we, we get to what I think is the big answer to the question you pose. I've given lots of technical suggestions. There are more technical suggestions. The purpose of the technical suggestions is agree or disagree about the particulars. There's lots of things that you could do to limber up the system and free it up so that politicians can do what they want to do. It turns out, left to their own devices, politicians want to create machines and parties to help each other because that's how they organize their mm -hmm. world. They, that way they can get up in the morning and know that they don't have to start from scratch creating a coalition or, and they don't have to face a primary challenge every time they take a controversial vote for the party. So that's the small stuff. Here's the big stuff, the big problem. We've spent the last 50 years inculcating ourselves as a country in the idea that to have intermediaries between the people and politicians is anti-democratic, corrupt, elitist, or all three of the above. We've inculcated the idea politicians should always be directly accountable to the people, and it's very hard to argue mm -hmm. against that. Now, you can point out, as no doubt you do in your classes, that the founders were very careful right. mm -hmm. to establish multiple layers of mediation because they understood that you do need an element of professionalism in addition to an element of populism. So they balanced both. They had direct elections for the House, but not for the Senate. Right. They had direct elections for the presidency, but also the original Electoral College, which was intended back then to be a break on it. Didn't work out that way. We've gone all the way toward people decide everything. The problem with that is it turns out what really happens is the special interests decide everything because most people don't participate in politics that much and don't want to. So the 10 or 12% of people who turn out for primary elections, who are choosing the candidates who appear on the ballot that all of us have to vote on, turn out to be a small, often unrepresentative and extremist sliver. That's not what the founders intended, and it does a less good job of representing the public interest and a larger population than party professionals do because they have to sit here and say, will this candidate appeal to a broad portion of the electorate? Will it unite the party and bring in new voters? That's their job. So my job, the people like me, call ourselves political realists, is to try to convince people like you and people like you that the system works better for the people when it is mediated, when you have these middlemen and middlewomen in politics. All these officials that you never heard of, people at the Republican National Committee, the state and county party chairs, the elected officials at the, at the, um, in the caucuses of the state legislatures, all these people working in between the people and the governing process and working through it to, to do the bargaining, to do the mediating, to help select the candidates, to vet the candidates, to make sure they're not sociopaths, to, to make the deals in the background, um, broker the bar bargains within the parties, then be able to enforce the compromise if they can strike a compromise with the other party. We desperately need those people, and after 50 years of saying that they were undemocratic and corrupt, we went too far. So my job, the hard sell, is to push against this overwhelming tide of populism and progressivism and say, you know what? We need to re-empower some of the very people we've been disempowering. Now, in your article that you wrote with Ben Wittes, you suggest that there's sort of a two-pronged attack the country could take. On the one hand, continue to enhance some aspects of popular participation, uh, expanding access to voter registration, changing the time of election or whatnot, while also trying to balance that by perhaps yeah. strengthening the yeah. parties. What, um, what would you say might be the first, the first step to take? Would it be, say, expanding voter registration, changing election times? What would be the easiest sell to at least get, to begin to get the people back on the side of this? Um, we also argue it is a myth that more participation will make people happy. Uh, most people want to participate in politics less, not more. They think politics is a pain in the butt. Um, so we think the idea, which is common, that the, if people if you just let people do more, participate more, they will be happier. It turns out to be, there's, there's virtually no support mm -hmm. for that. 
That said, we're also not saying that you should have some kind of strange elite model where you make it harder for people to vote. That's exactly the wrong way to go. People talk about, for instance, uh, voting on weekends mm -hmm. and voting by mail. And, and we certainly don't favor voter suppression and some of the things that are going on now. So all of those things should happen on one track, but they're not inconsistent with the other kinds of measures that also restore more discretion to the professionals in the system um, to do their job and to do it well. It's interesting when you think about it, the institutions that have the highest public approval um, in government are the ones that are the least participatory. The Supreme Court, Supreme Court, the Federal Reserve, and the US military. And that might be because they tend to function better. Um, people will be happier with government if it can get its act together. I think what they mostly want from Congress is that it, it's, it do its job and not fall apart and not constantly be in a kind of miasma of, of bickering. And there's a lot involved with, with making Congress work better. There's, I, I hope I'm not giving the impression that there's a magic button you can press that makes everything okay again. This is a long road back. Um, but the first step of this road is to start moving people's minds from a model in which direct participation is the chicken soup of American politics to a model in which no, maybe professionalism and maybe intermediation, maybe stronger parties is a good idea. If we can start making that shift in our heads, then we can collectively start thinking in a positive way about doing some of the changes that, um, that people like me, political realists, are talking about. Well, thank you. We're actually at the halfway point, and that's a good note, I think, to, to pause and turn to the audience and invite questions. So, thank you, Jonathan. Questions from the audience? Well, well lots. Let's start right here. Uh, and then, if you, if you will state the question, I will repeat it so that they can hear it for the stream. Um, I was just wondering if you could define what you mean by professional politician, and then also give an idea oh, as to great question. how after you define them, you present them as so to the American public so that these people actually end up in office. Okay, so what's a professional politician? Um, the way I think about a professional politician, of course you could say someone who makes money at it, um, but all politicians who are paid make money at it. Here's the way I think about it. These are people who are in it for the long haul. Some people call them careerists. Some people call them the political class. These are bad words in America. We hate careerists in the political class. We think they're corrupt. But, but here's the thing about politicians who are in it for 10, 20, 30 years, have multiple jobs, come up through the ranks, maybe start on the school board, then the state legislature, then the state secretary of state, then Congress, then the Senate, then maybe a cabinet job. Here's the thing about those people. They're in it for the long haul, which means once they make a decision in government, they have to live with it, and the party has to live with it. So they're thinking long-term about the brand of the party, and they're thinking about the effectiveness of government. If they come in and soil the nest by grandstanding and blocking a debt limit bill, you know, voters back home might love that. Politicians do that now. They will, they will shut down the government. Professionals gonna say, wait a minute, if I do that and this institution stops working, how is that going to affect me and the party five years down the road? So I think of professionals as repeat players. I think one of the biggest challenges we have right now is that increasingly the American public views professionalism in politics negatively. Amateurism is seen as a good thing. Um, the more amateur you are, the more authentic you're considered to be. Um, well, it turns out politics is really difficult. It makes rocket science and brain surgery look easy. You've got to take, literally, if you're a member of Congress, hundreds if not thousands of competing interests in your district. You've got to deal with all the other members of Congress. Everything you do is controversial. You're under constant threat of being hit with a primary. Every time you open your mouth, it's a potential negative ad. And that's before you get to the fact that somehow you've got to reach compromises with the other party. There's a lot of skill and craft involved in doing that. Um, the idea that you can elect someone with no experience at all at that, someone like Donald Trump or Ben Carson, go on down the list, and they're gonna waltz in and do a great job. 
You know, if I told Donald Trump, I know I'm going to walk into real estate and be the greatest builder in New York with no experience at all, he'll laugh at me. So I think part of the mission here, it's an uphill battle, um, but I don't think it's a hopeless mission, is to begin explaining to people why devaluating and disempowering your political class is a very short path to political chaos. Yep, please. Um, well, one quick comment as to what, uh, along with what you just said, is one of our candidates for governor right now in Virginia is advertising that he's the one who's never held elected office. And um, I'm not sure why anybody would want to make that a selling point, but he seems to think it is. So that goes along to your, with your point. Um, the, my question is, uh, when, when you're talking about that balance of giving more people more access to voting and elections and um, as opposed to those in power making the decisions, it seems like gerrymandering is a perfect question here. Uh, where does that, how do you see that falling with those two competing interests? Uh, so to repeat that, the first observation was that in the Virginia governor's race, one candidate is portraying himself as politically inexperienced, as if that's a good thing. I assume you mean it, Ed Gillespie, the Republican. Uh, someone, someone's chuckling. Why are you chuckling? I want to hear this. So, yeah, so, yeah so, so I think people are chuckling out there because the idea that Ed Gillespie is an outsider to politics is ludicrous. Um, he's a longtime lobbyist and he ran the Republican National Committee and he did so very, very successfully. He is a true political operator and his opponent, Ralph Northam, also came up through the ranks in the traditional way. He is a classic example of what parties are supposed to do, which is identify people and sort of promote them up the ranks when they turn out to be reliable and not sociopaths. Um, people titter when I use the word sociopath. So let me just say, I, I will get to your question, but if I may, um, here's, here's what I mean by that. <clears throat> political sociopath is not a medical diagnosis. A political sociopath is someone, a politician who does not care what other politicians think of them and doesn't need to care. This is someone who is capable and willing of doing whatever is in their interest in any given day without regard to the effect that it will have on other politicians in the system. These occur in both parties. It occurred multiply on the Republican side. I would argue that Ted Cruz fits this model, as does Donald Trump. Um, political sociopaths are dangerous to the political system because they're not accountable to anyone but themselves. The founders went to great lengths to try to protect the system from political sociopaths. One of the most important thing that parties and political machines do is test people for not being political sociopaths by forcing them to work, up, work their way up through the ranks so that by the time they reach the top, you think they'll be team players. They'll make reasonable political judgments. Ralph Northam is an example of someone who's been promoting that way. You could argue in the Virginia race that the real contest that was fundamental was not the contest, is not the current general election contest between Northam and Gillespie, the R versus D contest. It was the Republican primary mm -hmm. contest between Ed Gillespie and his challenger, whose name I can't remember. Do you remember it? Corey Stewart. Stewart, Corey yep. Stewart, <clears throat> who I would put in the political sociopath right. category. This is someone who does have some experience in politics, but appeared to be willing and capable of saying absolutely anything to win. These were two very different animals, and in the Republican Party right now, the guy who has paid his dues proved himself to be a very adept operator and is likely, if he can be elected governor of Virginia, to know how to govern Virginia, barely squeaked out a margin against an insurgent with a record that I would argue shows that he's very unlikely to be effective in that job. That's where we are right now. It's touch and go in all of these situations, whether people who have professional experience and who seem to be fit for the job, in my opinion, 
are going to get it. Now, you want the system to be open to insurgents, but you don't want complete chaos. Um, so gerrymandering, a big issue before the Supreme Court right now. I don't like gerrymandering on principle because I think it's unhealthy in a democracy for politicians to choose their voters instead of voters choosing their po mm -hmm. politicians. I also think, though, that gerrymandering is a side issue to what I'm talking about. Um, research that's been done on this, and there's now been a lot of it, suggests that gerrymandering has some effect, but not a huge effect, on the political polarization and dysfunction that we're seeing. Uh, Mark may have a different take on that. He's, he spends a lot of time studying uh, th these issues. But we know that because the Senate has become much more polarized and, it's, mm -hmm. and, and less functional, and it's not gerrymandered. So my spiel to people is, yes, think about gerrymandering, but also think about all this other stuff. Gerrymandering is not the cause of the collapse of politics' ability to organize itself. So let's at least give some time to thinking about reconstructing the systems, the behind the scenes systems that make politics work. So I'm not saying gerrymandering is unimportant, but I am saying, you know, it's become kind of an obsession, too much of a distraction. It shouldn't be the only thing we talk about. And just, just to follow up on the gerrymandering point too, gerrymandering is not new. It looks a lot worse because we have the digital power to gerrymander everything down to your doghouse in one district or another. It's incredible. But gerrymandering has been part of the fabric of American politics for over a century. Yeah, um, and, and in, an, uh, in, in an earlier era, gerrymandering could be quite positive, and here's how. You would set up a safe district for your elected officials, which meant once they were elected, they weren't worried that every time they cast a difficult vote for the leadership, that they were going to get primaried and defeated because they were in a safe seat. So it turns out to be helpful to have enough people who are safe so that they can make these tough political decisions that, that politicians often have to make. Here's what really changed that made gerrymandering a different kind of issue. In the old days, you had a safe seat. You were safe, right? Because the party was going to usually be able to squelch a primary challenge. A challenger wouldn't be able to get enough money or name recognition to come after you. In the current world, any incumbent can be credibly threatened at any time by any person, no matter how sociopathic. And there are tons of groups that will drop money on that people if, person if it's in their, in their interest, if only to scare the incumbent. Not defeat the incumbent, just scare the incumbent. Because they know if they can scare the incumbent, then in office, that incumbent will be too scared to cast votes that the interest group doesn't like. So suddenly, these gerrymandered districts are safe in the general election, but very vulnerable in the primaries. And that means it's open season for the special interest to intimidate the politicians. That's where we are now. Another question. Back there. Please. Yeah. Okay. Yep, please. Oh, okay. Um, I want to premise this by saying this is not to suggest the Senate is some bastion of productivity, but okay. do you think that if you were to extend or increase term limits in Congress, so instead of two years, which means campaigning every, really, you can't, you can't wait all your two years, you're going to start campaigning, really, you start campaigning about a year in, if not earlier, do you think that we could get, we, I mean the Congress, get more done, be more productive, maybe not be so much gridlock? Yeah, in other words, questions, should we have four-year terms for the House instead of two-year terms? Uh, you know, the old way of dealing with this problem of the constant campaign was safe gerrymandered districts. Most of the time, most incumbents didn't face a serious challenge. You know, if there was a primary challenge, it would be a 65-35 a or a 70-30 contest. So in practice, they didn't actually have to campaign and raise money 24-7. Now they do for the reasons that we've discussed. So, should we deal with that with four-year terms instead of two-year terms? I have kind of a stock answer to this, and it's kind of the answer I gave to the, um, to the questioner just in front of you on gerrymandering, which is maybe. But just for 10 minutes at a stretch, could we not think so much about changes in process and think more about strengthening the underlying political dynamics I don't think going from two to four years would make it all that much easier for Paul Ryan to organize his caucus and make it less susceptible to a minority that wants to shut down the government. 
Um, it might help a bit on the margins. It might hurt a bit on the margins. But I kind of think that we're like the story about the guy looking for his car keys under the street light because the light is better. We need to start looking more in the dark places where it's harder to make repairs, but more important. And that's starting to think about the political machines, the primary process, giving politicians incentives. So I'm kind of trying to change the subject. It's hard to do, because like all of these other reform ideas are floating around. Some of them are good. Yes. Um, where do you see the future of the Republican Party with Trump and versus the establishment? And where do you see the future of the Democratic Party with the lack of leadership? What a great question. So where do, where do I see the future of both parties, uh, Trump versus the establishment and the Republican side, and the democratic fragmentation? Um, all my predictions about politics for the last two years have been wrong, with one notable exception, which is I said if Trump was elected, he could not govern. I said the same thing about Sanders by the same way, for the same reason, just that they did not have um, the networks and the political indebtedness to, uh, to do what politicians need to do, which is get people on their side and organize and trade favors. So that prediction turned out to be right. All the rest turned out to be wrong. I never thought Donald Trump would be president. Um, when I wrote Why American Politics Went Insane, I thought I was writing about a situation where things had broken down to the point where Donald Trump was capable of disrupting the process but never becoming president. So the, the honest answer to your question is, I don't have a clue. Um, if, if you ask me to how I think about that question, I think the way you posed it is exactly right. The Republican Party is having a civil war right now between the forces of people like Mitch McConnell, who I would argue are the governing wing of the party. Now, it's not to endorse everything that he does. He's a controversial figure for good reason. And then people like Steve Bannon and Donald Trump, uh, insurgents, uh, Bannon in particular, uh, is a fan of chaos. That's his model. Um, those guys are now, Steve Bannon is, even as we speak, traveling, taking planes around the country, lining up insurgents to challenge the Republican traditional class. That is likely to make it continually harder for Republicans <laughs> to come together, to govern, to even act as a party. And we don't know how that comes out. It's, it's touch and go thanks to social media and thanks to the outside money <coughs> networks, and thanks especially to the mood of the Republican, much of the Republican base, not all of it, but much of it, which is the more disruption, the better. Virtually an anarchistic kind of feeling out there in the base. It's not clear that this thing can even hold together and function. On the Democratic side, um, you have the tension between the Hillary group and the Sanders group, but that's less prominent right now. Uh, what we're seeing is a remarkable outpouring of grassroots organizing and energy in the Democratic Party and on the left like nothing we've seen in my lifetime. And I go back 57 years. And it's of an interesting character because instead of just saying, we're going to have more marches and more protests, which is how Democrats and liberals have traditionally expressed themselves, this new group, and just talking since November, places like indivisible.org mm -hmm. and many others are saying, um, we've got to start winning elections. And that means organizing at the grassroots level. And that means things like there are multiple Democratic groups now suddenly that are focusing on recruiting candidates and backing candidates to run for state legislative seats. Because they've suddenly, took all this time, but they've suddenly awoken to the fact that by neglecting the workaday politics all the way down to the bottom of the ticket, they don't have the bench they need. They mm -hmm. lost the state legislature, so they get gerrymandered out of the process. So we're seeing this kind of new wokeness on the Democratic side to everyday politics. The plus of that is the tremendous energy that this is bringing to the Democrats. The minus to that is that most of this energy is way over, not way over, but, but substantially over on the ideological left. And the seats Democrats need to win if they're going to take control of House and Senate are swing seats in the South and the Midwest. And those people are not going to respond to Bernie Sanders candidates. Um, so you have that conflict in the Democratic Party. But I'm seeing, I think on the Democratic side, my own take is that I'm encouraged because I think on net, 
this new energy and focus on party building. Uh, the, the, I shouldn't say party building. On the mechanics of politics, even though it's taking place outside the party structure, is likely to bring a new dose of realism to the party. But, but we'll see. It, it may not. In the back. Please. Yep. Uh, term limits, would it make it easier? How would it affect politicians' ability to, um, to incentivize each other with carrots and sticks? So I'm going to go back to my stock answer. I think term limits, like four-year terms and multi-member districts and mail-in voting and redistricting commissions, I'm going to put all of those things in the category of quick fixes. Might help on the margins, might hurt on the margins, but let's talk about the main theme. Having said that, as you might be able to anticipate from where I'm coming from, which is that it's important to have professionals in politics. Um, I think term limits are a pretty dubious idea. Um, you need expertise, and expertise comes from sitting there for a long time, like being on the Defense Appropriations Subcommittee for 12 or 15 years so that you know the Defense Department inside and out, and when that bureaucrat comes to sit in front of you, you're not relying on some 26-year-old staff member to feed you questions on an index card. You can grill that SOB, and you know who to call to get information, and you know what a defense bill looks like. These things are really complicated. Plus, you've been around long enough to build up networks so that when people call you up, you can help them, and they can help you. Uh, I'm not in favor of amateurizing politics. Term limits are complicated because it turns out they don't drive professionals out of politics. They just force them to job hop more. So that means they can do one thing for six years, and then they have to find something else to run for. It's unclear to me how that helps. You still have experienced people in politics, but you don't have them sitting still long enough so that they can wield that experience. So I am very dubious about term limits. That said, many, many very smart, respectable people have a different view. Can I butt in with a follow-up? Yeah, please. Um, if we think about this at the national level, it's an, ex it's an extraordinary undertaking. Um, it would be hard to reform the national political system anytime soon. But in your research and the work you've been doing, would you be able to suggest other particular states, maybe, that seem to be reacting to the chaos and might serve as examples, good, well, better organized than average Democratic and Republican parties in particular states? And where might we, we look to see the beginnings of this counter-reform? Um, may I challenge your premise? Sure. OK, sure. You think it's easier Am I allowed to level? do that? Okay. I don't want to be a bad guest. Oh, please, go ahead. It is interesting I get challenged to, all the time. It is interesting to look at the states because they differ widely in their models of campaign finance and widely in the organizations of their state parties. Um, and there's a lot to learn from that. But I believe that it is a myth that it is structurally difficult to start making important reforms. Mm -hmm. Many of the things that need to be fixed can be fixed without changing a single line of law, believe it or not. Who decides who the nominees of the parties are? The parties do. Who decided that that would be wide open, done by primaries, and often done by primaries where people who are not even party members can vote Hello. for that party's nominee? Mm -hmm. The answer is, the parties decided that. They could undecide it at the state level by just the state party saying, hey, we're not doing it anymore. And in fact, in 2016, Colorado didn't do that. Colorado the State Party decided, we're sending our delegation to the national convention uncommitted. So they had an internal process where candidates kind of pitched themselves. But then the delegates all went unbound because the party said, let's wait until we see how this shakes out. And we'll have more influence at the end of the day if our delegates mm -hmm. can make up their mind on the convention floor. Conventions, party people, used to decide the nominee at the convention. We could do that if state parties just said, OK, that's what we're going to do. No one could say boo about it. There's no laws about that. Um, there's, similarly, there's lots of rules and regulations that are handcuffing the abilities of parties and professionals that the public doesn't care about. I mean, how many of you have spent a lot of time thinking about the rules on um, hard money limits and limits on coordinating with candidates um, using soft money? 
Raise your hand. Just keeps you up at night. <laughs> okay, so we have, a, we have two people, and one of them, maybe three, one of them on stage with me. I was just helping them out. <laughs> These are rules and regulations that the public doesn't know about or doesn't care about. Things like raising the caps on donations to parties, which Mitch McConnell wants to do, which a lot of other people increasingly want to do. This is not something that ignites the public fury. Most of these changes that were made over the past 40 or 50 years are technical changes that were done kind of on a promissory note of this will make the system more functional and less corrupt. Um, it hasn't worked. I don't believe the public would be deeply opposed to many of these changes. I don't believe the public would even know or care about many of these changes. Um, most people don't know that the party state parties have their hands tied by all kinds of regulations on what they can do. Some of them patently absurd. Uh, they've been put at a big disadvantage to the outside groups that they have to compete with. Um, those laws could be changed. No one would notice except the state parties. And when I went out and talked to state party chairs, both Republicans and Democrats, they may disagree on policy, but they both agree strongly. Why are we not able to channel our resources in support of our own candidates? with most of our budget. There's actually regulations that prevent yeah. them from doing that. Uh, so there's tons that we can do. What we really need to do is get our heads in a different space. So that every time some reformer says, but that would be corrupt, that would be insidery, we say, well, okay, but maybe it would work. Was that responsive? That was super. I kind of changed the subject it's on a, you, but it's okay. And you brought it right to seven o'clock. I could which go is on. The... Earmarks. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> Earmarks. No law there. That can be changed by a simple decision of, of members of Congress on their own rules. Committees in Congress. We disempowered the, the committee structure. That's mm -hmm. important because we cut out middle management. We said all the people who are involved in crafting and writing mm -hmm. bills with the expertise and all the information networks that they gathered. We kind of cut them out and sent that up to leadership, which doesn't work well. That can be changed by a, a simple leader of Congress changing it. Tons of stuff take away. Tons of things can be done. We just have to decide to get our minds around a different model of politics. Get our heads in a different space. Get our heads in a different space. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank, Thank you all for coming this evening.